for each of these, I'm curious to kind of get um, get out on the board, what are some context um, in your congregations that you've heard music called repetitive? Contemporary. Yeah, yeah. that's what I said. That's okay, so in your context it's mainly contemporary music, contemporary worship music, worship music. To say. Yes. Uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other? Singing the same song too many times. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So the song itself may not be regarded as repetitive, but the same song multiple, multiple times. For week to week. Yeah. Right. Week to week. Mm -hmm. Sure. Didn't we sing that three weeks ago? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Anything else? The chorus on every gospel song you ever heard. That's okay. Yeah. So a lot of there are certain kinds of music that are built on you know certain units of repetition yeah. and absolutely um, gospel um, choir music and we can talk more about the kind of the um, levels of repetition later. But what are some of the the features? What do people? What are people talking about when they're calling church music repetitive? In a pejorative. That's, usually. That's yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is, it's in a, the, um, um, well, let's go into, like, so what are some of the concrete things? They're using it in a pejorative way, but are they talking about melodies? Or are they talking about words? Words. Lyrics. 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 Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Word, yeah. I, I thought that that would come up at some point. Yes, the, uh, has everybody heard this this phrase, the seven, seven words repeated 11 times, the 711 um, chorus? <laughs> yeah. Okay, and somebody said that sometimes it's also um, the melody. Maybe the melody has, you know, just four notes, a pattern that repeats right. again and again. Yeah. Chord, chord progression. progression. Okay, yeah, okay. Chord structure. But then the band can play it. That's exactly right. Three, three chords of the truth. Three. That's all you need, right? <laughs> um, so, okay, so they can be talking about those things, but what about, you know, so this same same song multiple times, I mean, what are we talking, that's that's something a little bit different from these, these features here. So maybe something like repetition over time, um, you know, whether that's, and that of course differs from tradition to tradition, you know, as far as whether once every three weeks is too often just right, whether once every year <laughs> is not often enough or just right, you know, these kinds of things. So what are some of the, um, the reasons that you think, um, again, that, that uh, repetition has taken on this kind of pejorative connotation? Sometimes it's a lack of creativity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So sometimes, uh, you know, excessive repetition might imply lack of creativity. People say that it's because it sh has shallow lyrics. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So shallow and maybe maybe even you know if I could put um say I would put that in front but I, I have this I, this much more <laughs> I don't know this much chalk I'm gonna conserve it but this idea that um simple or that just a few words repeated yeah is necessarily shallow um, anything else kind of appetite for variety that's what's that appetite for variety okay for yeah, so it's a, the, the reasons for the bad rap is maybe that there is a lack of um, lack of variety, sameness, you know, and everything sounds, sounds homogenous. Absolutely. Was there somebody over here that... T tension between the choir and the praise band. Ah, okay. So let's get down to it. Yeah, so co concrete. Um, so reasons for the bad rap is that repetition comes to stand in for, or maybe even, you know, kind of uh, have a symbolic... <laughs> 
value in some of these um, inter-church um, or inter-congregational tensions? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, as you can probably guess, you know, today, um, given that this is, a, you know, in some ways, I thought about um, calling this a, you know, a rehabilitation or a, uh, uh, you know, something of, uh, of repetition, but, um, uh, but I'd like to, to point out some of, the, some of the differences. We'll get to a little bit later some of these different um, structural layers. I think one of the problems is when we talk about repetition, we're not all necessarily on the same page and on the same level, whether we're talking you know, on the micro scale, um, but then we'll also look at um, you know, how to think about repetition on the micro scale and how um, you know, thinking about some of these things will, can really help in your worship planning. So the allergy to repetition and worship, this is not a, uh, so certainly not a new um, discussion or a new issue, especially among Protestants. I point you to um, James K. A. Smith, his Imagining the Kingdom. He has this wonderful little section of the last uh, chapter that he calls Redeeming Repetition. I love the double meaning there. You know, repetition that redeems, you know, on the one hand, and then kind of trying to redeem, you know, repetition, uh, the good kind of repetition itself. But he has this um, lovely passage. He talks about, you know, we, especially Protestants, um, have a built-in allergy to repetition and worship, though we're quite happy to affirm the value of repetition in almost every other sphere of life, from study to music to sports to art. You, you have to engage in repeated actions to be able to progress in, uh, in these skills. And uh, he breaks down three causes of this allergy to repetition and worship. He says um, there's that fear, as I brought up earlier, of uh, vain repetition. And this is understood as repeated acts that are understood as works righteousness or spiritual insincerity or kind of trying to score points with God by going through a certain set of motions. Um, that's something that Protestants pretty much from the very beginning have been um, reacting against and uh, kind of afraid of. And then there's also this, um, the dominant understanding among a lot of Protestants today of worship as expression. And he talks about this when worship is understood as a private encounter with God. Uh, we must, you know, always conjure up novel or original ways of expressing ourselves. We see some, doing something again as being somehow insincere. And then he points to the, what he calls the cult of novelty, and I like this, you know, the chronological snobbery, um, this disposal mentality that we consume something and move on to the next thing. So he also points out, you know, this um, need to constantly change things up. Um, to dispose of, of what's always as, um, as part of uh, yeah, something that is, uh, that's, that's wrong with, but is uh, endemic in our culture. But worship is both expressive and formative. And he talks about the powerful um, formation that, uh, that repetition does within a, um, within a Christian service. And, and he says it pretty, pretty boldly. A Christian worship is going to be formative. It has to be repetitive. Secular liturgies already know this, yet Christians, especially Protestants, can be suspicious of this, but we need not be. And I love his um, uh, words here. God has created us as creatures of habit and meets us where we are. Indeed, the Father invites us into union with Christ through spirit-charged practices that over and over again sink us into the triune life. It is in their repetition that the story begins to sink into our imagination thus sanctifying our perception and engendering action towards the kingdom. And he does go on, we won't be talking about this as much today, but he acknowledges that you know, what we're repeating makes all the difference and how we're repeating makes a difference as well. Um, so I'm going to turn from, this is kind of, uh, I think James K.A. Smith makes the point about repetition and worship very well. I'm going to move on to, uh, again, using some of that, um, the, the musical neuroscience to talk about repetition in music. And uh, so one of the things that, um, that a musicologist and a music cognition specialists, um, and kind of in some ways a growing consensus, um, is that there are, very, there are very few things that music scholars are willing to say are universals and we're kind of in a particularist moment. We're just like, mm, not willing to say that everyone in the entire world, you know, uses certain things. Repetition is one of those things that there is a consensus on. Though. Repetition is a musical universal, whether you're talking about drumming, 
um, symphony orchestras or, um, or gamelan orchestras in Indonesia. Um, all music is built on repeating, uh, repeating patterns, and the music that isn't built on repeating patterns um, is, is, is usually somewhat esoteric and not what we're singing in our congregations anyway. So, unless you do some, maybe you do some John Cage in your, in your congregations, but might, might be a fun, you know, fun exercise to do. But uh, we, um, some music psychologists argue that repetition is not only a musical universal, but is the single quality at the very heart of what distinguishes music from speech. And um, to illustrate that, I love, I love this. Uh, so you, many of you have seen visual um, illusions, you know, right, where you know, one line put in a different context looks longer than another, but they're both the same. Well, there is a um, uh, music psychologist from the University of uh, Southern California named Diana Deutsch, who has put together this series of auditory illusions. So to illustrate this, again, repetition is the foundation of music, I'd like you to listen um, to a sentence. So this was a sentence that she um, spoke introducing, she's also a composer, um, she spoke this sentence in introducing some of her music. Then she manipulated it a bit. So we'll listen to the, the full sentence and then kind of see, see what emerges. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. But they sometimes behave so strangely. They sometimes behave so strangely. 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 So strangely. So strangely. So strangely. So strangely. So what happened over the course of that repeated phrase? Became a tune. That's yeah, yeah. It seems like she broke out into song, and I should say this works on for about ninety percent of people. So if you're one of the ten percent, that's just like what she was singing. I Jesus loves you too. <laughs> the sounds as they appear to you. The sounds as it is a natural human variation. But anyway, you probably heard something like this towards the end, even though this was. A spoken sentence. She um, she took a piece of it, repeated it again and again, and it enabled you to hear something that was that was there the whole time that you didn't hear the first time through. You were listening um, to it for its semantic content. You were listening for meaning the first time through. But by the time you heard it that many times, you started to you know the uh, pitch and tone of all of these um, started to come out. So I'll I'll come back to come back to that in a minute. But the interesting thing about it, so um, we excerpted that little part of the, um, of the sentence. Listen to the full sentence again. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. <laughs> right? Once, it, once you hear it, you can't unhear it. <laughs> I have, and and uh, I, had, uh, I gave this presentation um, at, a, at a university and um, had someone you know, put in the, like, the chapel comments, just like, thanks for getting sometimes behaved so strangely. <laughs> stuck in my head all day. What a weird thing to have stuck in there. Uh, but anyway, but we'll talk more, um, more about, I think, some of the, uh, the, the fascinating implications you know, that this has and maybe make a, you know, kind of an eschatological parallel. Um, in just a minute, but I do want to go on and talk about some other functions of repetition in music. So repetition is a musical universal. Um, repetition, one of the things that was brought up here, you know, the reasons for the bad rap is, you know, perhaps um, sometimes some kinds of repetition um, uh, are associated with a lack of variety. Thing is, repetition is what undergirds variation. You know, we have to have um, you know, certain things that are constant in order for us to appreciate the things underneath that, uh, that are changing. And so we can think of this in, you know, theme and variations in classical music, jazz improvisation, you know, over a 16 or 32 
barred chord structure, and we can listen to the same tune or the same chord sequence over and over and over again, again because there's repetition, but there are some things changing over top of it. Another thing that um, cognitive science and uh, marketing has uh, helped us realize is that uh, repetition helps us enjoy things that we might not otherwise. So if this, this is called the, uh, the mere exposure effect or the familiarity principle. Um, and this is basically the repeated exposure actually makes us like things better. Okay? We develop a preference yeah. for things mm -hmm. or awesome. people the more we become familiar with them. And that sometimes that sounds maybe a little bit counterintuitive because we also have you know, the saying familiarity breeds contempt. Actually, it uh, for the most part doesn't. Um, we start to enjoy. We, you know, it may, we might dislike something at first, and then we may tolerate it because we've heard it so many times. And then it may get stuck in our head, and then we might actually find out that we um, that we like it. And so this is used. This is a principle used in advertising, um, in politics. Um, that more exposure and over time equals more positive feelings about something. And so, uh, you know, one of the best uh, examples that I can think of of a music minister um, using this, so a music minister in a church that I attended um, in Nashville, it was a large church that had two services, they still needed two services, they had been split into by traditional and, and contemporary for um, over a decade. And the new pastor came in and said, nope, we're going to a one format service. It's going to be, I mean, everybody hates the, the term blended and the uh, convergent, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, we're not going to ditch either of these styles. We're not going to ditch organ, choir, band, you know, but both services are going to have an identical format. And uh, my colleague and the assistant um, director of this, um, of this team you went out into the congregation, you know, they were doing some canvassing, you know, some pastoral, you know, trying to get people um, ready for the transition. And one of the things that they found that in the contemporary congregation, whereas, you know, the assumption was, um, you know, at first that, oh goodness, this, you know, this section of the congregation, they just don't, they don't like this music, you know, they don't like the style, whatever else. What they found by talking to people is that I just, I don't know this. And it goes by so quickly, and it's such a different, a different style than I'm used to that I just can't, I can't really learn it. And then we only sing it every, you know, three months or six months or whatever else. And so familiarity is what they identified as the problem. And so this um, worship minister and and the assistant music minister, um, let me say this is Nashville, so uh, my colleague, you know, had a <laughs> had a small recording studio and was able to record um, the choir, choir and organ singing um, 25 of these traditional hymns that they were going to start using that the contemporary service folks wouldn't know. And they sent home a CD with them and said, please listen to these with your family, you know, listen to them in the car, or, you know, in your devotions and things like that. And after a few months, people started singing. Um, they, people who were in the contemporary service came up to them and said, I, I, had no, I would never have thought that I would have liked that hymn, but you know, I've listened to it enough times. I can sing along, you know, it's familiar. That's the mere exposure um, effect used to, um, uh, well, used, used to great effect in, um, you know, in a church music setting. Then repetition inspires movement. Um, I think that's in some ways obvious. When people hear a piece of music um, repeated, they're more likely to be able to move their bodies because they can predict where it goes next, which leads straight to the, the next point that repetition is a precondition for participation. Knowing what to expect and being able to listen ahead, you know, in some ways makes the experience um, meaningful and, uh, and pleasurable. And on this, the topic of uh, pleasure, uh, the Brian Rabinovitz, so this is, wouldn't this be an amazing job? Brian Rabinovitz is a neuroscientist of Christmas music. <laughs> oh, that's, that's awesome. That, that is how, I would say, that's how it's, uh, it's described um, in the article that, that I read on his work. But anyway, uh, Rabinovitz, Neuroscience of Christmas Music, explains it this way. Uh, he says, when we hear a song for the first time, the brain searches a catalog of musical structures that it's been building since we first listened to music. Whether we enjoy that music is contingent on whether we can predict patterns in the new music that align with what we have stored in our mental catalogs. Anything that repeats a lot has a greater likelihood of making it into our musical structure memory bank. 
And as long as renditions of the same song, so think of you know Christmas songs, you know artists are always covering these songs. I mean, they're always different renditions that come out every Christmas, right? As long as the renditions stay within predictable patterns, the listener will still experience pleasure by guessing um, what's next. And uh, he goes on to talk about um, that this pleasure comes from a, a dopamine hit to the brain and says that there is, there is actually a physiological reason uh, that sex, drugs, and rock and roll you know, are kind of all combined. It's the same area of the brain, um, the pleasure center, that um, the repetition in, in music is, is hitting. So moving on from, um, uh, from that kind of pleasure, I mean, repetition helps us experience you know, the, particularly the meaningful um, pleasure of belonging. Um, being able to guess what's next in a shared musical performance um, is, is directly related to this. And, um, and one of the things, let's see, uh, as far as functions of um, repetition in music, going back to that original example, Repetition actually deepens our understanding of the music. This is one of the things that um, uh, Dr. Margulis talks about, is that repetition enables a shift in our attention over repeated listenings. Um, and this works on the levels of both form and texture. So her research shows that we're able to pay attention when something is new. Um, we hear on the level of um, small scale repetitions when we're unfamiliar with a song. We can anticipate maybe the next chord or the next few notes of a melody. Um, and on repeated listenings though, our temporal span is zoomed out. Um, to the point that we can look even further to the next phrase or maybe even the next formal section you know, from verse to chorus uh, of, uh, of a song. And then listeners also shift their attention uh, to what's going on in the music from melody to rhythm to um, uh, other instrumental lines within the musical texture, certainly to you know, those of us who sing um, parts. You know, when we're learning a new song, usually it's good to get a sense of what the melody does, and then we can listen for um, alto, bass, or, uh, or tenor after that. So, um, so Margulis, um, I love this, um, this statement from her book. She says, repetition draws us into music and repetition draws music into us. Since human beings are fundamentally musical, when we understand more about this musical capability, we actually understand more about ourselves. In this way, something as simple as putting a track on repeat can serve as a window into who we are. So yeah, so, so, so deep, you know, kind of deep um, stuff related to, uh, to repetition and kind of going to the um, maybe a parallel, short um, eschatological parallel here. Um, I think it's a beautiful picture of the now and the not yet elements of the Christian faith. You know, so we're listening to, we're experiencing one sound in the moment, um, but as, as the Christian story is repeated in our, uh, in our lives, um, we can then perceive that present sound as part of a larger and larger arc. We anticipate what's coming next, it brings us joy and hope. So we're living kind of fully in the present and yet imagining the future at the same time. I mean, this is very much parallel to what Margulis talks about in musical experience that I think is, um, is wonderfully parallel to Christian, um, Christian experience. So we've talked a bit about the, um, the whys of, of repetition in terms of um, what repetition in music does, what repetition in worship does. I'd like to, um, to talk about, and I, this is a framework that I, that I developed out of, again, talking to a lot of uh, music ministers and kind of my own experience observing congregations and listening to these conversations about repetition and realizing, oh, we're not all sort of talking about the, uh, the same things. So with the what's in repetition, you know, this is, I think it's a problem of scale. Um, James K.A. Smith and then one of our Baylor doctoral students who also um, wrote an article that's more um, theologically and kind of biblically um, based on uh, defending repetition as well, um, Jacob Sensenig um, talks about um, you know, repetition on the macro and micro scales, but I want to break it down even further than that. So I'm going to propose four levels to help us think about musical repetition in um, our congregational worship. 
So level one is this repetition of you know, individual um, elements, musical elements or, um, you know, or words. Um, so um, let's see, do I have an example right here? So this level one is musical elements. So this is kind of the phrase level or smaller. And as we know, somebody want to hum that for us? <laughs> da, 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 da. Yes, I would say classical composers have been able to make amazing masterworks out of this small phrase level repetition, again, with crazy amounts of variation and so many other things, um, instrumentation and volume and, and uh, so on. But this can include repeated melodic cells, um, chords, or rhythms. And then elements may repeat on the same or different cycles. And generally, this is where, you know, this is where we, want to, uh, we want to change things up a bit, is that a lot of times when things repeat on the same cycle, this is where they can start sounding really homogenous and we can, you know, we know the song in, uh, you know, two, <laughs> two times after that we, after we've sang it, we're just like, we're, you know, we're done with this. Okay, that was easy to learn, um, but no longer has any interest. So you can have a very simple, um, repeated melodic cells, chords, and so on, as long as there are other things that are varying um, at the same time. So I figure, uh, so multiple levels of repetition at the same time, um, so the, uh, or how to make an earworm, uh, another master work, um, make perhaps not quite to the level of, um, of Beethoven. Anyone with young children recognize <laughs> this one? Oh, Be yes. Today, they just, I saw a clip on my phone, they're using it to drive homeless out of homeless shelters, uh, and not homeless shelters, but off the streets into homeless shelters, they're playing it in cities, so it's so obnoxious that they will leave. Oh, oh my goodness. I came over today. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll say, and that's one way to look at it. So it's so obnoxious that it's going to drive people into homeless shelters, and yet it is so, you know, capturing that this was the most listened to song in 2018 on YouTube. I mean, I think it, I think it has like 3 billion um, hits by now. My girls love this song. If you have not been privileged enough to hear it, so, <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll drive it out of your mind with some other things later. So, uh, so listen, we, we will just go through a little bit of it, but think about what levels, and look if you, if you want to or listen, um, on what levels are there, uh, is kind of level, level one repetition in this song. Pitches, pitches. Yeah, so you have this one, right, you've got this one melodic contour, you have a repeated four notes, uh, or four, uh, four chord structure. This one, however, has some very, we at least have a key change. <laughs> this one is hard to play on the chord. Let's, let's go hunt, or you know, whatever, the, whatever the verse is there. Yeah, so in making an earworm, um, you, uh, what makes this you know, brilliant or terrible, depending on uh, your, your point of view, is that there's repetition on so many levels. And again, our mental frameworks are able to take all of the music that we've heard and instantly you know, slot this in. And of course, because it ends on you know this unresolved um, you know half half cadence, it just keeps going around and around again. And I, I promise I will, I will watch that um, out of um, out of your uh, your ears in just a moment. But uh, so multiple levels of repetition, recognizing um, level one repetition. And I bring this up. This is uh, this is one of um, has always been a meaningful um, contemporary worship song to me. This is a Matt Redman, 2002. It being 2019, I was told last year it made me feel super old um, by one of my students in class. She's like, Dr. Ingalls, this is like my mom's contemporary worship music. <laughs> so anyway, um, but think about on um, uh, what levels of repetition you hear as we, uh, and please if you know this, um, do sing along with me, Blessed Be Your Name. Yes. 
what did you hear um, as far as level one or other other forms of, of repetition in this song? What makes that relatively easy to um, to apprehend and to join in? Chord patterns. Chord pattern. pattern. Yeah. Melodic no, phrases. That's okay. And so the rhythm, blessed be your name. Um, and then of course we've got. Um, those two kind of verse verse one and verse two with the melody the rhythm the chords everything is repeated for that before you get to the channel or pre-chorus whatever you want to call it, every blessing you pour out even within that the line two and line three are the same melody just That's with different words exactly that idea of the melodic cell <laughs> service and so my email rings when I phone <laughs> as well. So uh, anyway. Okay, so back to uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> I asked. Um, okay. Uh, level one repetition. So we've got this melodic cell that repeats again and again. Other observations. Exactly. That's right. So repetition of the you know of the central idea. Blessed be your name. Yeah, one four one four, and then um, when you get to the chorus, it's hammering in um, hammering in that idea. So good. Level two. Let's move on to that one. So song sections. Okay. So you've got your uh, you know kind of standard contemporary worship song order, which is something like. Verse, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, chorus, bridge, 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 chorus, verse, chorus, 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 chorus. Um, and then you have, you know, an even simpler structure than that, which someone mentioned uh, Taizé earlier, which is AAA. Well, hopefully it's like a, a prime, a double prime, a, you know, that there's, again, variation is key here, um, you know, as we all know with song sections to make sure that they're not sounding, uh, sounding homogenous. So let's do, let's listen to one another, and I'm going to listen to you as well um, to get some of my cues as to, to kind of how to accompany this song. Let's sing it four times and see how different each of the, uh, the repetitions of the sections can be. So I'll give you the, the last line as an intro.
like I'm in a room of musicians or something. <laughs> um, all right, so that is level two song sections. Um, what I have here on level three is um, is church season, and this is of course you know going to depend depend on your tradition. Um, some church seasons are of course um, you know uh, defined by uh, by the liturgical calendar. Others might follow a topic or an emphasis you know that maybe changes every three to six months that the um, the leadership team determines. And so this is where I think the um, the very diet comes in. I'm sure that a lot of you have heard um, you know, that that metaphor is very common when talking about um, when talking about church music. And I love um, Zach Hicks's um, book. It's one of the resources recommended on your um, handout. He has a whole chapter about the um, these are kind of different images of who um, the worship leader or the music minister is. And one chapter is theological dietitian. And um, I follow, you know, as, as a you know, good American who loves fried food, um, but you know, so struggles sometimes with my eating habits, I follow nutrition research with, uh, with some interest. And one article that I found um, a few months back was really interesting because it talked about, um, you know, nutrition researchers were trying to find, is there an optimal diet as far as like balance of carbs and fats and proteins um, for the human body? And, and the thing that they found by studying a number of uh, people groups, a lot of um, kind of hunter-gatherer, small-scale um, societies, is that, uh, no, <laughs> there are a number of healthy diets across cultures. Everyone needs, you know, each of the three basic food groups and certain um, vitamins and minerals, but there is no optimal balance, sorry, of <laughs> carbs, fats, protein, etc., that works for every group. Because, I mean, you're talking about across the world, you're talking about people in subarctic conditions, um, you know, who maybe need all of that fat that they're getting, you know, from the seal blubber or, you know, whatever else, and then people, um, you know, who are in the, uh, the rainforest where it's hot all the time that need a very different kind of diet. Um, so, and I love that there was one um, Kenyan group that they studied that gets a full 15% of their daily calories from honey. <laughs> Just like, if they can do that with honey, surely I can do that with sugar. <laughs> anyway, uh, but humans are great at adapting to um, the materials at hand. You know, again, provided that they are quality ingre ingredients, not grown in a laboratory. You know, I'm not making an, uh, you know, we'll think more about the, you know, parallels to worship songs produced, you know, more or less specifically for consumption, you know, at a later time. There's some parallels perhaps to be made there. Um, but on this level, you know, using songs of the same style, which can include instrumentation, tempo, mood, these kinds of things can sometimes lead to the perception of repetitiveness. I had a student in um, one of my undergraduate classes called Song of the Church last semester that wrote a fascinating um, final paper that was basically all organized around this one observation that she made was um, the, at her church, which is a larger um, church here in Waco that uses um, contemporary worship music, there was this uh, common critique, you know, among people that heard, you know, so our, our worship music is kind of repetitive, you know, it's kind of we sing the same songs all the time, um, and that was one thing that she was, um, that she, uh, that people specifically pointed out in this critique was, we sing the same songs all the time. So as part of this class, one of the things that I have them do is document what does the church actually sing um, for a nine-week period of time? She documented this and found, actually, believe it or not, there was only one song that repeated in the entire period that she studied. So she's like, well, what's going on here? You know, either, I mean, obviously, there, you know, the church, may, maybe there were the same songs, maybe that was a response to that critique. Um, but uh, one of the things that she hypothesized was that um, it was the same instruments, Every song had the same overall shape of basically starting soft and building and building into the bridge as the climax and then you know going back down. And so every song had exactly the same shape, the same instrumentation, and that led people to perceive that they were singing the same songs all the time when actually they weren't. So, yeah, fascinating stuff. This is why, yes, empirically studying what is <laughs> going on and then... Um, figuring out from there. We're going to um, um, skip past a um, uh, discussion I had in case there was time and go on to level four, uh, core repertory. So this is the largest level of repetition. This is 
the repetition of songs as part of your church's canon. Canon is something that, um, that Constance Cherry um, has talked a great deal about in her um, music architect, um, something that Zach Hicks also talks about in, uh, in his book. And this is one of those things, kind of like liturgy. You know, a lot of churches don't think they have a liturgy. You do. You know, try changing where the offering occurs, and you will, you will know whether or not you have a, you know, a fixed liturgy. Um, every church has a canon as well. Uh, now, maybe that canon, you know, completely changes every six months. I hope it doesn't, you know, for a variety of reasons, you know, related to um, repetition and, um, and how it forms us. Um, but uh, Jacob Sensenig, in his article on repetition, he um, had this to say on planning songs in the free church tradition. He said, the worship planner must have in mind the goal of long-range sustenance instead of simply finding songs that match the sermon theme each week. Or for churches with structured liturgies, this could apply to, um, this could also apply uh, to lectionary readings. I know, uh, so my, my tradition, I've, I've been in a number of different traditions, um, but um, I am currently um, worshiping in the Episcopal Church, and one of our problems is lack of, uh, one of the things we're trying to fix in our church is the fact that we have this, this wonderful, you know, a trove of uh, hymns in our hymnal and the, the, the local tradition of, um, you know, of our church's body, um, but we might only get around to them twice a year. Are they forming people if they're, um, you know, if we're only singing these, like, not often enough really for them to, to know the words, to be able to carry the words with them? So I think this is a danger, you know, whatever kind of, of, of church you go to is paying attention to that poor repertory um, or canon. And so um, this is just an example. I imagine a lot of you do um, probably even more high-tech things than this. This is just an Excel spreadsheet, and this is the way I've um, kept up with um, with songs uh, over uh, over time. And you can see um, the, uh, basically, if you just have the song title, the date, um, what service, if you have multiple services um, at your church, what position uh, the song was in, um, and take a look at that, review that every on a you know, six month to yearly basis, then you can not only see you know, what your church canon is, because you have one, um, but then also you know, based on your church's mission and vision, what do you want that canon to look like five years out? And start planning for, okay, which of these is that enough of you know of this song? Do we need to bring this song you know up in our rotation? Is this where our community's life um, you know is right now, or is this something that we want our children <laughs> to be able to you know to take with them because they've sung it uh, often enough in church? So I know we are we're running. Um, uh, we've got about five minutes left, so I did want to uh, to leave you with turn to your handouts on the back of the uh, the handout. There's a series of diagnostic questions um, for each level of repetition. So these are things that you can um, you can take home that you can um, discuss with others on your leadership team, or if it's just you, you can apply these um, to the songs that you sing in worship. So these, you know, the first level repetition is there a good balance again between repetition and variation to stay away from um, this the lack of variety homogeneity um, uh, critique. And then in a song with a lot of internal repetition, um, like a song like Blessed Be Your Name, what, uh, or Isaiah, uh, what elements of the arrangement um, can be varied so that it doesn't bore people, so that um, it's something that people stay engaged to participating in. Second level of repetition, what ideas or themes would repeating part of a song emphasize if there's an idea um, possibly um, that's in the second verse of a song? You know, would it be? Could you could you repeat that again for emphasis? Um, the um, and then to what parts of the song is the congregation responding the most? And this is something that you can observe, you know, in a performance and then make changes the next time, or if you're in a more charismatic style, you can just change that on the fly. People are really responding when we're singing the, um, you know, the chorus right now. Let's sing this a couple more times to really let it um, settle in deep. 
And then um, third, uh, how often has your congregation sung this song? If it's new, um, and I'm sure you've heard this elsewhere and you all have a lot of good strategies um, for um, being a heard, heard a few more times before the congregation knows it. You can introduce it in the offertory, um, in other parts of the service, and then you know maybe you'll want to be more intentional about bringing that back um, every couple of weeks or every month until the congregation is comfortable with it. And then third, um, you know, is there a balanced diet of song and mood? I think we probably would all agree that we want to avoid the situation that, that I described where people thought that their, um, that their music, that they were singing the same songs all the time when they weren't. It was just that everything had the same shape, uh, the same mood, the same instruments, and so on. And then thinking on that largest scale level of what is your congregation's core repertory currently, um, and then what songs would you like to be forecasting into the future? One of the things that you know, doing something like this does is help you think about, okay, what balance of songs, what balance of um, you know, styles or genres or individual songs do we want to be um, in part of our congregation's core repertory in the, in the coming years? So that's, that's what I've got for you today. Thank you so much for coming. Um, do feel free to, uh, to stick around if you have any questions and uh, have a wonderful rest of the conference. Thank you.